right, welcome to another Deep Dive at Five. We're so excited that you're here with us. I'm Pastor Tony Sanchez. I got Pastor Jeff Robinson here with me. We got a good, good topic to talk about today. But before we do that, we just wanted to highlight a few things as we start out. And the first is this past Sunday, we had a beach baptism. That's right. And it was incredible. And we had... 12 get baptized and so we had a baptism this past sunday people saying yes i've committed to christ that's right i want to take that next step and then we also had another one last month pastor jeff so yeah with those two baptisms we've had over 30 people get baptized over the last two months even with the way this year has gone people are still saying hey i am committed to jesus Absolutely. and i'm taking next steps so we're just so excited about that and Absolutely. the waves were rough the waves were wild yeah i think i think the strongest sets of waves since since we've been doing beach oh, baptisms yeah. i can remember i don't know about oh, you yeah. tony yeah you had to be there to see some of uh, some of the pastors oh. fall over that's how <laughs> I, I almost went down on the last one <laughs> monster <laughs> monster waves yeah and we were trying to we were trying to time you remember we were trying to time yep. the, uh, the baptisms you know because it, it, it was crazy undertow but it was good because tony we ended up with the same amount of people yep. that we started with, which in a beach baptism, that's what you that, that's what you always want to do. You yep. never want to leave with less. Yeah. So it was, it was a great time. Should have brought a boogie board. It was just that good. <laughs> but but it was great. So just make sure if you ever want to take those next steps, we're gonna have another opportunity in December for a beach baptism. But listen, you can get baptized at any point at any service if you're coming uh, live or if you're still watching online. Beach baptism. You're outside. There's nothing like it. So we'd love uh, to get that from you. You can sign up online at our website. You can check that out. And also, this coming Sunday, we're going to have our next virtual starting point. So right. if you've had questions about Grace, you've been wanting to meet some of the staff, the leaders, the directors here, um, or, or just see what Grace Fellowship is all about, and you're like, I am ready. I'm committed. I, I, I agree with what the church teaches. I agree with the mission of Grace. And we want you there. And you can sign up online and we'll do it, we'll do it through Zoom. And it's right there at gogracefellowship.org. So sign up for that. It's just going to be a good time as well. And we'll be there. Um, and, and they're just always so interesting and so good to do these virtual starting points. So. And also, if you have been on campus with us and our in-person on-campus services, especially with the 10 a.m. service, Pastor Tony, what, what have we seen? Growth. People. A lot. A lot. To the point yeah. that we're looking around the room saying, mm, we probably need to, we probably need to make a decision. Yeah. So we sent out a survey, I guess it was for two or three weeks, just mm -hmm. seeing what you as our church family yeah. uh, have to have to say, your thoughts, your ideas about uh, more services to make room for fulfilling our mission, which is the reason why we exist, the reason why we're here is to reach Palm Beach County, South Florida, and the world for Jesus Christ. Right. So to that end, we are starting an 11.30 a.m. service, Pastor Tony, on Sunday, November 15th. And that will be another Sunday service ongoing. And so we're going to try this. What we're going to be, be doing is an 8.30, a 10 a.m., and 11.30 a.m. service on Sunday. So if you um, would, if that scheduling of a service would fit with your with you know your process on Sunday morning we would love to see you and it may be that you've been with us online mm -hmm. since all of this mm -hmm. started and maybe the Lord has been working in your heart uh, to say you know what I think it's time for you to go back if that's what the Lord is leading you to do I would encourage you to come to that service on Sunday November 15th we'll be back at three full uh, services on every Sunday morning. So we're excited and we want to yeah. thank you guys because here's the thing. If nobody invited, if we just all kind of did our own thing and forgot what Jesus had placed us here to do, which is to make disciples, this likely would not be happening. Absolutely. So it's the sovereignty of God working in your life, working in uh, and through your invitations, through your networking, through your friends, your relationships, and more people are coming. So we've been having to have the conversation. Don't miss this. Don't, don't miss this to say, what do we do with not just online growth and people being reached, but what do we do to make more room for more people in person, live on campus? So we give all God all of yeah. the glory. This is his church. This is his work. And we give thanks to you guys as our church family. And so many of you guys are with us for the first time. Some of you guys are just testing out this thing called church or Christianity and what it's all about. I can say for both of us and our team, we are 
honored. We are yeah. pumped that you're just willing to consider these issues and talk through uh, the data together. So welcome to Deep Dive. Yeah, glad that you're here. And like you said, it's just a, it's great to see that God is at work. Even in 2020, we're seeing growth, but we also know that the extra service is going to help us, um, not just because we're growing, but because we also want to still remain safe. And we know that's important right. and that's valuable, but right. we continue to move forward because we trust Jesus and we move forward even in these circumstances. Yep. So we know that that's important. So let's dive deeper. Like we just mentioned, like Pastor Jeff just mentioned, and I'm going to throw a question over to you, Pastor Jeff, with everything that we talked about this past Sunday. Um, here's a question for you. How can a person's relationship with their earthly father, this is, this is a big one. We, we mentioned this some on Sunday, and we know that everybody's in a different position when it comes down to how they grew up, whether they grew up with a father that was a, a loving father or a father that maybe was just kind of there but not always there, or maybe you didn't grow up with a father at all, and we know that. We know that's a reality, but yeah. the question, and we, and we can work through that because I think it's important, how can a person's relationship with their earthly father affect their perception mm. of the heavenly father? Perception, we've heard before, perception is, is what? Reality, yeah. right? Perception is reality. And if the question, Tony, is how can a person's relationship with their earthly father affect their view of their heavenly father, then what can happen and what often happens is our earthly father kind of sets the tone for the way that we view our, our heavenly father. Um, we know just just from psychological studies that a good relationship, especially for a young man with his father, mm -hmm. is really foundational to our, our level of confidence um, in life. And usually uh, what can happen is for those of us who have grown up without a functioning father role in our life, sometimes we can drift towards uh, a tremendous level of insecurity or we overcompensate mm -hmm. and we become uh, not like a, a, a tough guy, but a violent man, mm. right? An angry man to where we think that in order to be a man, we have to be rude, we have to be gruff, we have to swear worse than, you know, any sailor, right? You have to be so, dominant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, yeah, yeah. You cannot be humble. You have to be in control of everything. And, and mm. you don't have to be a Christian to see the fallout of, of those directions in our, in our lives. And so to answer the question, um, how can our earthly fathers, our perception of our earthly father affect our view of our heavenly father is if there have been trust issues with our earthly father, that can often in a, in a, in a huge way affect our trust of God. For example, if our earthly father has walked out on us, mm. has been a walkaway dad, or if we never, if we never knew our mm. earthly father, or if our earthly father is there, I mean, he works and stays faithful to mom, but he's kind of emotionally distant. Mm. It's like you could have more emotional connection with an oak tree, right? Right. Than your dad. It's like, well, he's really stable. Yeah, well, he's stable. Yeah. He's kind of like a tree. Like there's no, you know what I'm saying? There's yeah, no, yeah, there's no yeah. words of encouragement. Passive. You don't, yeah. yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And to where um, a father can often withhold his affections mm from his children. For right. example, right. if um, you grew up and you didn't often hear your father say how he approved of you and how mm -hmm. he was proud of you and that he loved you, not just because you hit a home run in the game, not just because you won a chess tournament or because you made good grades, that can create in any and all of us a struggle with not only our own confidence in who we are as people, but even more so a basic lack of trust because the way God has set up the family is the father should be, as God has called him, we look in Ephesians chapter 5, to be a stability point for the family and especially for his sons. And so if that's absent, there, there can be an eroded trust in our lives. On top of that, if you grew up in a home to where maybe your father wasn't emotionally absent or physically absent, he was there, he was very much involved, but he could never turn the channel from the criticism channel. Mm. You know what I mean? It's the type of father figure that's in our lives to where we can never feel like we can satisfy him. Mm. Nothing is ever good enough. There's always critique. And I'm not talking about constructive mm. criticism. Any good father, any good parent has constructive criticism, right? So their child can grow and yep. progress and mature. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about to where it's like the PhD 
and critiqueology. Yeah. Like they're just they're going to critique it, they're going to criticize it. Doesn't matter how well you do, they are never satisfied. So all that to say is that if you feel that number one, if you were never able to know your father, um, know who he is, and number two, if you never felt that you were able to really get to know your father and he was in your life, but he was kind of distant from you, and third, if you knew your father, but all you got was criticism and put downs, then there can be the struggle of what even psychologists today, who are not Christians, this is not just a Christian concept, they call it the father wound. There's also a famous author now named Lee Strobel that if you're, if you're a Christian, you might be familiar with his name. He wrote The Case for Christ, The Case for a Creator, and a number of great Christian books that have helped many people come out of atheism to Christianity and really to help Christians understand why we believe what we believe. Yeah. He says in an interview with Alan Satterley several years ago, in the context, this is fascinating, where Lee Strobel's talking about the father wound, which again, as we've said before, you don't have to be a Christian to understand what a father wound is. That's actually in the, phil in the, um, the psychological world and those who work with counseling and so forth, they understand this is a real thing. This is not a, a theological concept. This is just a fact of the world. That Strobel's testimony is in part his own father wound. As he talked about all these atheists who had strained or absent relationships with their own fathers. And, he, and Strobel says these words. He says, the implication is this. Why would you want to know a heavenly father if your earthly father has disappointed or hurt you? The Case for Christ movie portrays that. That may have been something, the father wound, that nudged me towards atheism. So that's the testimony, not just of Lee Strobel, but of many people who have been willing to be honest about where we are and the relationship or lack thereof or the dysfunctional dysfunctionality that was involved in our relationship with our father. Now, yeah. obviously, that's not every one of us. Some of us grew up in homes to our father. He wasn't perfect, but he loved Jesus and he did his best to, to love us and to love our moms. But in this dysfunctional world, there are so many of us that grew up without that, that foundational piece for our confidence and for our trust. Now, again, that doesn't mean that you cannot grow to be a confident person. With Christ, all things are new. That doesn't mean that you um, are, are doomed to have eternal trust issues in the rest of your relationships. Absolutely. This just means that there, honestly, there may be more of an opportunity for an incredible story of grace. Mm. So all of those factors can affect how we view um, God the Father, our Heavenly Father. And something to remember is that God, the, is that God, God the Father, He is not our earthly father. It's not one in the same. So whatever emotional uh, issues we're trying to work through, we have to think clearly and that God is not the same as our dad. Absolutely. Even if we had a great dad, yeah, like God is totally not my dad. Yep. Yep. Like in the sense of like my earthly father, he is far greater than even the greatest earthly father. Yeah. Something else to consider is that God has already provided everything that you will ever need mm -hmm. through Jesus Christ. He has provided an identity for you. He has provided a promise that whatever is needed in our lives to fulfill His call and His plan for our life will be provided. He promised us in the Great Commission that I am with you even into the ends of the earth, even into the end of the age. He will never leave us and He will never forsake us. And on top of that, Tony, as a follower of Christ, we can say with truth, we are adopted we are chosen into the family of God. Here's what the Word of God has to say in Romans chapter 8, verses 14 through 16. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit Himself, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God, bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And in the day and time that these words were written, 
the adoption of children being brought into a family, that was tremendously, tremendously meaningful. Mm -hmm. If you were adopted, you were in and you were not getting out. You would not be kicked out. You were adopted. You were chosen. You were brought from not having a home, not having a family mm -hmm. into a loving family mm -hmm. to where the father of the home would give his life for you. Absolutely. And so as a follower of Christ, I, I want you to, to, to consider if you do have some of these lingering trust issues or confidence issues that may or may not stem from uh, the failings of your earthly father, know that that is an opportunity in your life for you to be tenderized through the grace of God. Yeah, and I, and I think those last two points are so important. The fact that God gives us a new identity in Christ, everything that we need, and that we're adopted. And I think that's so important because if not, what we end up doing is we can maybe come to the point where we agree, yeah, obviously God isn't the same as that father that maybe was absent in, in so many ways or yeah. absent in general. But that also keeps us from blaming God and saying, well, God should have known. God mm -hmm. should have known. Why would he give me that father or not give me a father? Right. So we, we, we separate those two things. Yes, we can have an earthly father that is a great example and that, yeah. that certainly helps us to understand that relationship with God in a very clear way. Yeah. But we also can't let the opposite happen. Um, and that's why the adoption and the identity is so important because yeah. we also know in the day that we live in today, we have a lot of mixed families. That's right. Um, and that's true. I mean, that was true for me. That's true for mm -hmm. my wife where my wife and I were both raised by stepfathers mm -hmm. who we called dad because they came into the picture when we were very young. Yeah. Um, so we, we had an absent fathers at a very young age where our mothers then eventually uh, moved on from those relationships and they remarried. Um, and so those stepfathers came in and we don't look at those stepfathers as like second place in a mm -hmm. sense, but they raised us. But then when you get older, you learn about these things and you maybe have questions and it, yeah. it impacts you in different ways. But just the understanding that just like those earthly fathers, in a sense, adopted us and raised us as their own. It's the same incredible picture, just mm -hmm. like when you have a child who maybe you know, had to get separated from their own family and another family comes in and maybe that's true for you. You've adopted a child or you're fostering yep. a child and what do they want? They want right. to feel like they belong. That's right. And like they have a place and somebody's going to love on them and God mm -hmm. does this in a, just a magnified level when he yep. talks about what he does for us spiritually and how he provides for us in every other area of our lives. That's so I right. just love that picture that you had, Pastor Jeff, about that. I think that's that's so vital. It's so important yeah. in regards to that that truth. And and Tony, that that's a, thank you for sharing that just out of your own life. Yeah. And that that goes into a larger discussion that even sociologists have today. What is parenthood? <clears throat> what does it mean to be a parent? And I think across the board, no matter whether you're a Christian, uh, an atheist, or another religion, th this, is like, this is like something that I think God has created us in His image. We can see this, that parenthood at its core is the assumption of responsibility over somebody else. There may not be a blood relation. Yep. There may not be any level of, of physical relation. It may not be your flesh and blood. Mm -hmm. But like you're talking about adoption, that is the heart of, of that parent or th those parents saying, we, this is not our offspring physically, but because I have a desire to care for this child, we assume mm -hmm. the responsibility for his or her welfare. Yeah. That is my child. Yeah. We may not even look the same, yeah. but that is my child. Yeah. Just like my biological children. That, it, that child is now part of our family. I assume responsibility for them. You know, the beautiful picture is, again, this may be um, if you know of, uh, you have friends in your life, colleagues who are not yet followers of Christ, this may be an entry point for the gospel. That's exactly what Jesus did for us. Yeah. He came in and on the cross, he assumed responsibility for my sin. I mean, the Bible tells me that outside of Christ, before Christ, I was an enemy of God in my mind through wicked works. Mm -hmm. My heart did not want to follow Christ. I was running away from him. But in his gracious mercy, mm -hmm. he, through the work of reconciliation, he absorbed my sin and your sin and our brokenness on the cross. And he assumed the responsibility for my sin. And through that, he adopts us. Through the finished work of the cross, he adopts us into his family. So all that being said, Tony, I think it's a great point as you bring out, you know, the actual adoptions that we mm -hmm. see, even in our church family. Yeah. 
And, uh, and many times you, you see that it's just a beautiful picture of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And even for those uh, of you guys that are not yet followers of Christ and you have adopted a child, I want to encourage you to consider the larger context of the New Testament and the Lord Jesus himself and the Apostle Paul because it's the example of Christ, the work of Christ, that actually, I guess we could say, Tony, fills up the category of what makes adoption awesome. Yeah. And what makes adoption, like no matter what you believe, you're like, that's a good thing. I support you in that. Even if you don't want to adopt anybody, you're like, I, I support people who, who adopt. That's a great thing for our society and our neighborhoods. And it is because that models the heart of God. Yeah, absolutely. And the gospel. Absolutely. Yeah. All, All right. Good. So I, I think we, we talked through that at some length. So <laughs> let me ask you a question here, Tony. What are some practical steps that I can take to live in faith rather than fear? Yeah, faith and fear, huh? Sometimes it feels like those two don't go together, but in a lot of ways they do. Um, and so uh, there's there's been a lot of uncertainty this year, right? There's been a lot of uncertainty with health or health care, um, mm. economic uncertainties. Um, we have to face these things, and now as we get closer, you know, we have political uncertainties. That's just a reality with this year. Mm -hmm. So all those things come together, and naturally we're going to have fears, fears about yeah. our families and, and what we need to do to, to keep things going, you know, fear of maybe losing or we have lost a job, uh, we've lost influence, we, we, we've mm -hmm. lost things that we didn't expect we were going to lose. Um, and that's something that's not just true for this year, that may have been true for you years ago, or that may be the possibility here um, in your life in mm -hmm. some way. Um, that's just something um, that's true. So this can lead to fears uh, and feelings of anxiety and fear. Um, and feeling fear is natural, right? I mean, we, we yeah. know that when we sometimes experience some kind of fear, it even can protect us yeah. in different ways in our lives. Right. We, we know that's true, right? That's true for little kids when mm -hmm. they know, okay, I, I don't know about this, if I should mm -hmm. be doing this, right? And as parents, we come in, we love them, we yeah. say, no, that's not a good idea. And, and as adults, that's true too. But what does that fear do in our lives? How does that lead us to respond because if we're mm -hmm. controlled by the fear then that's when things start coming into our lives and we allow things and maybe even people into our lives that we mm -hmm. shouldn't and that can impact us in so many different ways so faith over fear doesn't mean that we never feel afraid but it means not letting the fear consume you and you don't let it lead you to act in a way that first of all you shouldn't act or maybe to lead you to live a double life mm -hmm. or a life you never thought you'd have to live um, so I got a, a couple of examples because the Bible talks about fear, addresses fear a lot. Mm -hmm. And so a couple of that I, that I have here, um, one of my favorite ones is in Joshua, the chapter 1. So we see that Joshua comes in and he starts leading the, pip, the people of Israel and he has mm -hmm. just, a, just a big role to play as their leader. Um, but God says that he's going to be with him and he's going to guide him and he's going to guide the people and they're going to move forward. They're going to go yeah. into the, uh, the promised land. He says this in Joshua chapter 1 verse 9, I have, not com have I not commanded you, and this is God speaking, be strong and courageous. Mm -hmm. Don't be afraid uh, or don't, don't be frightened and do not be dismayed for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Uh, it's just a very popular verse, a very important verse, and we see that that really leads Joshua to have this confidence mm -hmm. that's already been put into his life, and even more so as God speaks into his life. Yeah. Uh, we see this with King David. He believed that the follower, followers of God should not be ruled by fear. And in Psalm 27, mm -hmm. verse 1, he says, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Right? Very, very common known verse. Mm -hmm. Whom shall I fear, David says? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be, shall I be afraid? And then the Apostle Paul talking to Timothy, right, young leader and follower who, who he's, he's helping and uh, in his faith and, and to lead as a pastor, he says, for God uh, gave us a spirit not of fear but of power and love and self-control in Second Timothy. So these are just examples mm -hmm. where um, these leaders are not denying that fear is real. I mean, yeah. these leaders went through some things. King David with his own sons, mm -hmm. he just feared not just for not, not so much for his kingdom, but for how his sons were acting and how he was going to respond, or the fear he felt when he he sinned with Bathsheba and he knew that he was at fault. Um, I can only imagine what Paul felt, even though he was as confident as he was, but the fear of uh, you know, being in a cell and, and as joyful as he was, you know, am I going to be able to go out and encourage Christians again? Or when, when is my time going to come to an end, even though he finished the race? Um, so just a lot there, knowing that fear is a reality. Uh, but can that fear in certain areas of our lives maybe even elevate us to maybe lead in a way that we never thought we could have without that? Where God says, I'm with you, that is a fear that you have in your life. And I know that's happening, but know that it's not unique. Like I know what you need, right? We mentioned that a few mm -hmm. weeks back when, when uh, we talked about 
Jesus mentioning that in the in the book of Luke, in the Gospel of Luke, where he says, you know, are, are you not more important than birds? And like, I know your needs, um, but come to me and seek first the kingdom. In the same way, when we have those fears, we trust and we put our faith in God that he's going to get us through those fears. If he's done it before, he'll do it again. Um, one of the things I thought of when it came down to faith over fear is I thought of my wife getting closer, to, when she was getting closer to transplant, and she asked me, well, what if, you know, you know, God is faithful, but, but what if this is the end of the road? Mm. And one of the things I always tell her, and, and, and this is not my word, this is from God, where he always reminds the people of Israel, uh, I, I brought you out of Egypt. I took you to the promised land. In other words, I, I did this once. I'm going to do it again. Mm. And so what I would tell MJ was I'd say God did us, didn't bring us this far to fail, regardless of the outcome. God is going to be faithful and we're going to move forward, even if moving forward may not, may, may not be what we may think moving forward is. Mm. And so I, I, I always encourage her with that. And I'm thankful that we're on this side of things. Um, even if the outcome would have been different, we know that God would have still been faithful because he's walking through it with us. And so even though we had fear, mm -hmm. we had to put our faith in God, knowing that he could help us yeah. through that fear. Um, so it's just a simple example of that. Yeah, not saying that fear That's isn't good. real. I'm just saying you should never feel it. But knowing that how you respond... I think matters more than anything because guess mm -hmm. what? You're always going to have fears, right? I think about you, Pastor Jeff, or anyone who has children. You're always mm -hmm. going to have this this sense of, of fear and, and wanting to make sure your kids are doing well. And even with your, when you're old and gray and they're adults, they're still going to be your children and you're always going to think and worry about them. And I'm sure that's true for mm -hmm. my parents too yeah. and, true, and for you all as well as, as, uh, as uh, parents or, or for those of you that have uh, uh, already left the home and your parents even in their older age are still thinking and, and having that fear and they trust that that you're going to be okay but that's still there that's a reality mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. yeah so let me throw another question over to you as, as we just move forward just just some important stuff here um so what does jesus shepherding ministry look like in our lives what does that look like mm. especially that picture of shepherding i think that's an important yeah concept well tony i've not been around a lot of shepherds right I've not been around sheep. Yeah. When I lived in Texas, I helped work cows a few times right. on, on a ranch, and that was that was awesome. But uh -huh. cows are not like you. From what I've been been told, especially with cows, you drive cows. Yeah. Right. So there's you can be on your horse, you can have your your dog to help, or the modern day equivalent is you get on your four wheeler <laughs> and you drive the yeah. cows where you want them to go. Yeah. But I've been around goats. And it seems like you had goats. I had goats. Yeah, I you, did. Yeah, this I had guy some was Nigerian a goat dwarf goats. farmer. Yeah. yeah. So they and you know what? They they're a little similar from what I've read. Not been around sheep. Um, they're they're not as they're not very smart either. You know, sheep aren't very smart. That's goats what I aren't heard. Very yeah. Smart. Um, but but I did have goats, and they're 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 just a lot of fun, especially when they like jumping on your car, and you're like, I'm not gonna get that fixed, but there they go. <laughs> <laughs> so there's like cat paw marks. On cars, and then there's yeah. like goat hoofs. They're like, yeah. huh, what is yeah. that? You're like, yeah. oh, no problem. It's my goats. And they're like, thanks, have a good day. In South that Florida, a, like, what are you talking about? That was a fun time. Yeah, it was really good. Yeah. But I, I've not spent a lot of time one-on-one, yeah. -on -one, you know, with just watching sheep kind of do their thing. But what I've been told is, uh, and it is honestly reading, you know, Bible commentaries yeah. and such, is that shepherds lead the sheep. They don't necessarily drive the sheep like a cattle drive. So Jesus' shepherding ministry in our lives can look like um, shepherds leading us, him, him leading us. Psalm 23 says he leads me beside still waters uh, because it seems that that's the, the places that the sheep can actually lie down and rest. And so Jesus can, can lead us in his shepherding role. Um, shepherds also, from what I've, I've learned and read, they, they correct the sheep. Right. You have to give them. No, don't don't do this. Don't eat that poisonous plant. Don't walk on that cliff. Oh, don't walk off that cliff. So mm -hmm. shepherds can provide kind of like that that guardian role. Right. Keeping the sheep where they're where mm -hmm. they're safe. Mm -hmm. And then another role of shepherds is that they defend against the wolves. Yep. That the wolves are out to get the sheep and to get the flock. And you see that in, in, a, in a sense um, with David. Right. Uh, before he became the one who defeated Goliath, he defeated the mm -hmm, bear. Mm -hmm. In that day and time, ancient sources tell us that Palestine was filled with animals like that, and that actually they ceased to exist in any real form 
uh, primarily after the Romans. This is for, for our historians. The Romans had such this bloodlust, not just for gladiatorial games, uh, man against man, but also man against beast. And uh, the populations were incredibly thinned during that time. This is about, you know, a thousand years before that. And so it was a wild, wild place. But David, as a shepherd, defended his flock and defended his sheep against that which would do them harm. Uh, and in a practical sense, Tony, I would say something to consider as we grow as men and women of Jesus, that Jesus has provided means. Jesus has provided something practical in our lives so that we can be shepherded to follow him. And I think above all else, outside of the fact that he, the Spirit of Christ, the Holy Spirit indwells us and leads us in our daily lives, he's provided a community. He's provided, uh, for those of us that come from military, military background, a forward operating base, a gospel outpost, which is called the local church. That's what we are here, Grace Fellowship and Church for All Nations. That we have accountability here, we have a team, we have deacons and, and elders and servants all across our church family so that we're not doing um, our Christian life like this show years ago, The Lone Ranger. Right. Right. And so I know they, they, made, they did a remake. I haven't seen it, but it was with Johnny Depp as Tonto. And I'm like, I, that's just kind of weird. So I, yeah. I haven't even seen the update. But the old show, right, Tonto and, and The Lone Ranger, is kind of like just kind of just doing it alone, doing yeah. his life and doing, mm -hmm. you know, his crime fighting things with the silver bullets and so forth uh -huh. or whatever he carried. Um, there can be the tendency, I think, especially, Tony, for those of us that are raised in the West and especially in this country, to view our Christian life in individual terms. Yes, individuals get saved. We don't get saved necessarily like because we're a member of a particular family, right, or an ethnic group. That's not the way that it works. It's as, a, as an individual, we become a follower of Christ. But he calls individuals together in the context of the local church so that we can, through his leadership and through the systems that he has put in place in a church with spiritual leadership and so forth, be led and be shepherded by Jesus um, and by the institution of the local church. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25 tells us, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. So I say that, Tony, to say that there are some of us who have been involved in churches before and we feel like we've been burned. Yeah. And that's a very real thing. Like, and here's two pastors at a real church in South Florida. We understand yeah. that church burnings happen where you get just get burned from a leadership decision or somebody doesn't act Christ-like or it's just a really dysfunctional local church. We fully, ad we concede that entire point. Hear that from us. But if you're a follower of Christ, don't let someone or some group's sin mm. keep you from fulfilling your mission for Jesus Christ. And I believe with all my heart, I believe this is biblical, I believe it's healthy for us to work out our Christian life in the context of other believers. I really believe that. I don't think it's healthy to just simply hop from church to church. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I don't think it's healthy at all for us just to, uh, to have a sampling here, 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 and here. And since nothing actually satisfies us, we refrain from being involved. Because God has given each one of us, Tony, spiritual gifts. Yep. And it doesn't work in other aspects of our lives. No, doing that. not at all. We don't. It, bra it breaks down logically, right? Unless I find the perfect house, unless I find the perfect school, right? right. Unless I find the perfect job, I'm not going to get, wait, you're not going to get a job? You're not going to send your kids to school? Right. I mean, or I'm, I'm going to find the perfect spouse. Well, good luck, <laughs> you know? And if you think that, there's going to be a certain point where you're going to realize she's amazing, he's amazing, but... They're not perfect. Yeah. So all that being said is you're exactly right, Tony, and this is where sometimes our past experiences, even going back to the father wound issue, our past emotional wounds can sometimes cloud our judgment to where we think mm -hmm. that we're thinking. We think that we're making decisions, and we are not even within the zip code of making decisions. We are simply acting out of unresolved hurt. Yeah. So all that being said is that, yes, there is Christ in us, the hope of glory. Yes, the Holy Spirit indwells us, and he will never leave us. But he, he is in us 
to help us fulfill his mission of making disciples for all nations. And I believe that the means that God has ordained to bring about that end, to bring about that result, is through the local church. Yeah. And this is warts and all. This is problems and all. Because if Jesus loves the church, he doesn't love the church because the church is filled with people who never, who never um, disobey him or, ne or, or who are you know, somehow perfect. No, he loves the church because he is good and the church is an object of his mercy and his grace. And even through um, the fact of some, I think one of the reasons why, the, why Christianity is supernatural, Tony, is because the church has survived so much bad leadership, oh, yeah. bad decisions, poor preaching. And here's two preachers, right? Yeah, that I, don't, yeah, I, I, mean, absolutely. I mean, there's sometimes you're like, oh my goodness, I hope I didn't put any, I wonder how many people actually put to sleep, right? And you look, you look at how the church um, is just so imperfect, if that mm -hmm. makes sense, because it's filled with imperfect people. But I believe that God is still at work within the local church. And you see that because that's, churches are being planted all over the world. That's, what, that's the means, again, to repeat myself, but I want to be clear. Mm -hmm. That's the means that God has ordained um, to reach the world. To which some may say, well, Pastor Tony, Pastor Jeff, it's just me and Jesus and I don't need the local church. To which I would respond with what has Jesus said about the local church? Yeah. What did the apostles and the prophets say about the local church? What posture did they take? What did they model for us? And we find in the New Testament, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, Galatians, all of these books and these epistles were written to local churches. churches. Yeah. It was the church in Corinth, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, and so forth and, and so on. So all that to say... Mm -hmm is that if we think that our Christian life is just simply me and Jesus doing our thing, Jesus is my shepherd, I don't need anybody else, I don't want to be involved with anybody else. Well, what did Jesus actually model? And what did Jesus' disciples, who he personally tutored, if we could say, personally mm -hmm. mentored, mm -hmm. what did they actually do? What did they model for us? Local church. Yep. Then it's the quintessential question, do you really think that Jesus knows what he's talking about? Because if Jesus knew what he was talking about, it seemed that Jesus is a pretty big fan of the local church. Even though, even in the New Testament, guys, even in the New Testament, in the Bible, the Apostle Paul is writing first generation church. I mean, this is fresh, I mean, right out of the oven. And he's writing to churches that already have dysfunction. Yep. Always. That's like in the first century. Mm -hmm. That's the, I mean, you would imagine, Tony, if the Apostle Paul was the pastor of this church, I'm going to guarantee you, as lead pastor, we'd have a way better church. <laughs> if he had my job and, and he was sitting in the seats, the Apostle Paul, way better church. But yeah. even in the first century, Paul, Peter, all of them, there's mm -hmm. still issues in the church because we're still, we're still working. Christ is still um, uh, cleansing us and working in us. And guess what? That's, the messiness of ministry is an evidence that God is actually at work. Yeah. Good. And so Real good. I would just say, say, encourage you wherever you are, whether you're in South Florida or whether you are in uh, Juneau, Alaska, or whether you're in Greenland or wherever. I mean, we have, it's so cool to have some of you guys watching all over the world. Um, I would encourage you if you're a follower of Christ, do this. Partner up with what Jesus loves, yeah. your local church. Yeah. Get involved, serve Give, be a voice of reason, be a voice of encouragement. And it could be through your investment that in many cases he could bring health out of, uh, out of um, dysfunction. And here at Grace, we just want to say we love you as a church family. You guys have been tremendously gracious to us, especially during this time of, uh, of 2020. Um, I praise Jesus, Tony, that, that our church, we're on mission. We're seeking to reach people. Uh, this is not honestly reflective of where we are in terms of a church with drama. God has given us, I think, a clear vision. We're here for the main thing. We, we exist to reach Palm Beach County, South Florida, and the world for Jesus Christ. But all that being said is that if you are not plugged into a local church, kind of circle back around. And if you've been hurt or wounded by a local church, don't let that past hurt rob you of the beautiful chapters that he wants to give you in this period of your life and going forward. Absolutely. Especially because you know that even if you may have been hurt and we've all been there, there's another coin, another side of the coin to that is that there are people that are doing all that they can to be faithful. 
yeah, in the local absolutely. church. Absolutely. Just like if you are leading in some way in the church mm. or you want to lead, you know that you want to do the same. Mm -hmm. And so people make mistakes, but God still says that he loves the church. He died for the church and that the church will still be here until the day that he returns. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Final question, yeah. Tony. Um, how does a believer in, in Christ distinguish our relationship with God as opposed to other religions? Good question. Um, it's very broad. Yeah. Relationship with God versus other religions. Very broad, very open question. So picture a relationship being all about these things. A list of do's and don't do's, right? So let's just start out there. What if a relationship was like that? So you're with someone, whether it's a parent or a, a relationship with another person, a boyfriend, girlfriend, whatever it may be, uh, a marriage. And it's just basically here's what you need to do and here's what you shouldn't do. What would that relationship look like? Doesn't mean we don't do things in relationships for sure. another person, but let's just say it was that. Or just keep on going further and basically it's results-based. I remember... When before I was in ministry on a full-time basis, I worked for certain companies. I remember working for uh, AT&T at one point. And the model was, what have you done for me today? It mm. wasn't the results I had for them yesterday or last mm. week or I had a good day. But it was basically, what have you done for me today? So imagine that in terms of not just your earthly relationships, but a relationship with God. Let's keep going. What if your relationship was all about uncertainty? I love you today but I'm not sure if I love you tomorrow. We'll see. Or I'm not, I wasn't even really sure yesterday. But today I think I pretty much love you, at least to a certain level. Let me put it on a meter and we'll see where it's at. Maybe a 9 out of 10. It's like insecurity city right there. Yeah. Right? So to-dos, not to-dos, results-based, uncertainty, or maybe it's all about doubt. Like I can't really answer those questions. You may have questions about God or you may have questions about that relationship, but I can't really give you an answer. There's just a lot of doubt there. Now, why do I say that? I say that because when we look at this question, we take some of these and we just put that towards what we think God is. And we let that overtake who God has actually revealed himself to be. And if you take that a step further, when you take the Christian faith, you take Jesus Christ and what it says about who he is, what he's done, what he represents, mm -hmm. everything that he fulfills, that relationship he has and that, that, that unity in the Trinity, which we don't have time to talk about, we mm. see all that and then you compare that, because we do that, we compare things, with other religions, everything I just mentioned is pretty much how other religions function. Mm. It's pretty much, are yeah. you good enough? Have you met these requirements? Yeah. Um, have you done these five things? And if you haven't done these five things, then how does God view me? How does God view you if you, you had a bad day? You know, what does that look like? And we, we automatically know that doesn't work in relationships. We know it. We know that if, if this is how a relationship is, then we start questioning what's going on in that relationship. Is it me? Is it other, that other person? Is it the choices that I'm making that maybe I need to change? And yet, we do that in earthly relationships, but when it comes down to who God is, we tend to continue in those kind of dysfunctions and those questions that we have, but we feel as if we just have to live that way because we don't have another choice. Mm. And when we look at the gospel and we look at Jesus, we see that it's that's not the way it is. That's not yeah. only the way it shouldn't be on earth, but that's not the way that it is with who Jesus uh, represents himself to be to us. And that's the biggest difference is that Jesus says to come to him. Uh, one of the, the passages that I think of, Pastor Jeff, is that passage when... Jesus with his disciples, and, and you're talking about these guys that were with him for over three years, and they're seeing him do miracles and, and, and doing all these amazing things. He's about to feed, and then he feeds 5,000 people with this young boy who just has a few uh, fish and, 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 loaves of and a couple of pieces of bread. And then all of a sudden he asks them this question, who do people say that I am? Mm -hmm. Who do people say that I am? What do people understand about me? And then they kind of give a few answers. And you know, some of them probably didn't say anything. And then a few of them said, well, you may be Elijah or, or one of the prophets or, or uh, just so, someone who's, who's great. And then we see Peter steps in and he says, no, you're the Messiah. You're the Christ, the son of the living God. And I think today we see that in the world. We see that even in the Christian faith, there's uncertainty. And we just maybe are afraid to speak up and speak out for different reasons. Or we may be very sure about who Jesus is or 
we are somewhere in the middle. And, uh, and, and it kind of comes together with everything we've been talking about in regards to adoption and identity and who Jesus is. And that's why Jesus is so clear about his mission and what he's doing. And basically going back and saying, you've always lived in a, a certain way and you've always believed things should be this way. But let me tell you what God intended to li for life to look like and for a life to look like in that relationship with him. And I think that's why Jesus says, who do people say that I am? And then he just flat out directly tells them, who do you say that I am? Mm. What do you believe about me? You've been walking with me. You know the truth. Mm -hmm. Do you believe this? And so when it comes down to that question, I think that's so important mm -hmm. um, in regards to that personal relationship as a believer. I think the answer is right there in the question. It's a personal relationship, yeah. not something that's distant. It's like we want a healthy relationship in a marriage, in a relationship with children, with our children. Mm -hmm. If you have children, mm -hmm. you want a, a good relationship with your family and with your friends. That doesn't mean it's always the case, mm -hmm. but it's still there. Just like you desire answers to those deep questions that matter. Right. When we look at the Gospels, when we look at who Jesus is, does he answer those deep questions? And I would say when you compare that to other religions, the answer is yes. I believe that Christianity, we believe that Christianity answers those deep questions. Yeah. doesn't mean we get all the answers to our questions. Mm -hmm. But we see that Jesus answers those deep questions that allow us not just to move forward because he's healed us by his sacrifice, but then he uses us in some incredible way to be and take part in that. Just like Adam and Eve were, were to take part in and, and be part of, of, of uh in the garden to be able to take care of what God created and he brings us along in that creation to have responsibility in the same way he calls us out of sin to believe in him and now we get to partner with him so, something so incredible and we get to see yeah. people's lives changed and we're, we're just so taken aback by that because we know that we're also fallen and we're sinful and we mess up mm -hmm. but we move forward because of what he's done in our lives so I think that's yeah. a big difference the fact that we can have a personal relationship versus Am I missing the mark? Absolutely. Or am I doing what I'm what I'm supposed to be doing? Or am I wrong? You know, and I think of a, a, of some atheists like Anthony Flew or yeah. or others who come to the end of their lives yeah. and and um and some others that, that I can't I can't think of their names right now who at, even in their deathbed some some tyrannical leaders yeah. are were still questioning that I that I waste my life that I do the right thing mm. and it took all the way until the end for them to either hold on to their their hurts. Mm -hmm. and to just hope that they got it right or to just continue in that questioning until they took their last breath. Yeah. And so it's a, it's a deep... That, that is a deep well. And yeah, yeah, we can stay there all day, but we don't have that much time. But, uh, <laughs> but I know there's a lot there. And, and, hey, but and this is deep this dive. Is deep dive. That's what we're right? doing. Right, deep exactly. Dive we're, at five. We're, we're diving deeper in that. So it's just that personal relationship, the same way that yep. we would want that in an earthly relationship in so many different ways. Mm -hmm. um, the same is true with, with who God is. And, and uh, gosh, if that's not true enough to the fact that we have a, a, a creator who loves us and is so intentional in the, right? Not not somebody or a God that's just out there like in like deism where it says that God created us and he's just separated from us now or or a God who, you know, like these the Greek gods who basically they get upset and then they, rea they react and then we don't know how to react and how do we appease God or even... You know, depending on your culture, how that impacts your view of God. But but it's so true. And that's why uh, a big part of our church is the fact that we are a church of all nations. That's why? Right. Because in that same picture of adoption, in that yeah. same picture of who God is, one day when we're in heaven, all that stuff, race, culture, all those things, it's all just going to be one. And it's not going to, those things aren't going to define us anymore. Even though some of those things matter in regards to our culture, in heaven, all that matters is that you're going to be a son or daughter of Jesus. And we're going to live together and it's going to be like it never was before. The way it was intended, it will be once again. Mm. So, mm. Well yeah. said. Yeah. Well said. Yeah. Well, guys, we tried to take a deep dive today into some heavy <laughs> topics. Everything from uh, what makes Christianity and our relationship with God different yeah. than uh, any other religion to father wound, to Jesus shepherding us. And so our intent, our purpose, our heart 
behind doing this is to be an encouragement uh, to you believers and also to help clarify for those of us that are not yet a follower of Christ to clarify, number one, what exactly is Christianity? Because there's so many versions out there, Tony, that are just yeah. off the wall. It's like Jesus never said that. The apostles never did that. Like that's not, you know, what it is all about. And so to encourage our, our believers and our church family and those of you that are beyond uh, this area or beyond grace. And then also, again, to clarify what Christianity is and to encourage you, if you're not yet a follower of Christ, to consider the claim of Jesus Christ, who we believe was far more than a carpenter, far more than a prophet, that he was the son of God and he is still living and he desires to work in your life. So before we go, I want to remind you once again that on Sunday, November 15th, 15th yep. we're going to three Sunday morning worship services, 8, 30, 10 and 11.30 a.m. If you were an 11.30 a.m. Um, uh, member, participant, yeah, you couldn't wait for it every week before uh, this all started, it is back again. So pass the word, and we want to make more room for more people. We want to worship God. We want to do that safe and sanitary for you and your family. Grace Kids will also be happening, and uh, a lot of great things are going on here. We encourage you to come, and this Sunday we encourage you to come 8.30 and 10 a.m., and then online 8.30, 10, and 11.30 a.m. But again, on the 15th of November, we will be back to all three services on campus and online. Thank you guys again for watching. We love you. Let us know if we can pray for you or if you have a question about the Bible. And we look forward to seeing you at Grace on campus or online this Sunday. God bless you, Grace.